and I'm a reporter with San Jose Inside. Uh, tonight we will be joined by San Jose City Council District 4 candidates, Barry Essett, Union School District Board Member David Cullen, and council member, the council, current council member representing District 4, Land Yep. Uh, tonight's forum is sponsored by Silicon Valley at Homes Action Fund and California Yimby. The forum is also host hosted by Silicon Valley Community Foundation, Tech Equity Collaborative, Abode Services, EAH Housing, First Community Housing, and Destination Home. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and start off now with a, a question about opportunity housing. Um, the, each candidate will get two minutes uh, for this question. Um, and we'll start with David Cohen. The city's general plan task force recently discussed rezoning single family neighborhoods to allow for missing middle housing, such as duplexes, triplexes, bungalow courts adjacent to urban villages where transit is readily accessible. 84% of residential land in San Jose is zoned exclusively for single houses and the UC Berkeley Othering and Belonging Institute found high levels of this restrictive zoning were linked to greater residential segregation. Do you support extending this type of housing to single family zones throughout the city beyond urban villages? Why or why not? Well, I want to thank the uh, sponsors for hosting this event tonight and uh, thank you, Grace, for moderating. Um, I, as, for, as far as opportunity housing, I think that we need to study opportunity housing. I think the big issue right now is that when we are um, a building affordable housing and adding denser housing, we are doing it only in certain parts of the city. Um, we are um, building uh, housing in higher density along our urban our rail corridors, along our transit corridors, um, which I think is the right thing to do. Um, but most of those transit corridors are in only in certain districts in the city. And per, District 4 actually has a large amount of, a large number of those um, transit corridors. We have light rail along Capitol, we have light rail in North San Jose, we have the BART station. So we're taking a lot of the density in San Jose. And there are lots of parts of the city that are not taking up their fair share of the density in San Jose. And so the idea behind the opportunity housing is that certain parts of the city that are not um, getting enough density and not uh, building affordable housing should also be building some affordable housing. So we should be studying um, whether or not other parts of the city uh, should take up some of that affordable housing in areas like Almaden and, and Willow Glen that, that um, will not continue to put the burden on the east side of San Jose and building all of the affordable housing. Grace, I think you're going to me, but you're on mute, so. Oh, I said Councilman Diep. Yes, so so thank you for the question and thank you for all everyone who's joined us tonight. Um, thank you to SV at Home and, and the organizations uh, that are hosting. So on, on the issue of opportunity housing, I think the real question is, uh, are we open to a rezoning single family housing areas? I think that's the heart of the question. And I think for San Jose, we have a plan in the general plan uh, to uh, focus on urban villages. And this plan is not something that the city council uh, created. It is something that, that went through a general plan task force process that reflects the will of, of uh, San Jose residents. And I think the, um, the balance that is being struck is that we as a city uh, agree that we need to densify, we need to uh, allow for more housing and more people to come to San Jose, uh, but we should select uh, carefully where we do it. And, and we've identified urban villages. Um, and so let's do that first. We, we don't really have any of the urban villages up 100% yet. I'm excited about what's going to happen at the uh, Barrios of Bart Station, the urban village around there. We're looking to, build, to bring about 5,000 new housing units and, and 20,000 or so new jobs uh, to that uh, parcel where the flea market is right now. Um, and let's see how that goes. And, and we can densify uh, in the future uh, gradually. But I think um, it is strategic to do it around urban villages, along uh, transit lines, because people who uh, need affordable housing uh, often need access to public transit or have other needs as well that are readily available within walking distance, uh, you know, uh, groceries and, and amenities, restaurants, uh, coffee shops, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, to start densifying, to start with densifying uh, the uh, outlier parts of San Jose, uh, you know, uh, Almaden uh, that was mentioned, uh, necessitates people uh, who, who need affordable housing but may or may not have, have cars. And right now we're working at VTA to densify to uh, not intensify to 
pull into the core to speed up uh, public transit on a more regular every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, so it becomes readily usable like you see on the East Coast. If we spread public transit across the city too widely, it's not useful to everybody. So a follow-up to that question, uh, you know, immediately following the general plan task force meeting on opportunity housing, local neighborhoods, primarily in the affluent areas of the city, took to social media platforms like Nextdoor and Facebook to express their opposition, claiming that if adopted, this would change the character of their neighborhoods. What do you think they mean and how would you address this? Uh, Councilman Dieppe, let's start with you for this one. So I, I won't venture to guess uh, what they mean. Um, I, I understand the fear of, of change. I think that's uh, readily understandable and relatable for, for anybody. Um, any sort of change is, is scary, except we all know that change is inevitable. And, and so uh, what's important is what will we do to shape that change in a positive way, in a way that uh, is beneficial for the city, beneficial for future generations. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, uh, you know, racial relationships among groups. And I think part of that we can infer that uh, you, I don't want the, the neighborhood makeup uh, of my neighborhood to change when we bring in more people, when we bring in people of different incomes. Uh, but I, I, I know and I'm certain that everybody on the city council and all the candidates running uh, for city council uh, won't uh, relent to that kind of talk. Uh, we, we are a diverse city. We have 40% of folks who uh, speak a different language who were born outside of America uh, living in San Jose. and. Uh, you know, today is Constitution Day. The Constitution was made for America to change. It, it builds in that flexibility. David? Uh, well, let me just say, that just in, in response to something we said before, I, I, as a council member for District 4, my focus will be on urban villages. Um, we have really uh, been uh, far behind in building out the urban villages in North San Jose, and our focus in District 4 should be making sure that the urban villages in North San Jose are built. Um, my, my concern is that while we're doing that, we also need to figure out how to get some affordable housing in other parts of the city. Um, when it comes to the concerns um, of uh, that people are having in single family home neighborhoods, I know a lot of it has to do with, with parking and extra vehicles if we densify in some of those parts of the city. And those are legitimate concerns that residents have. We need to find solutions to that and we need to be thoughtful about how we might uh, rezone some of those neighborhoods to make sure that we're not going to overburden the roads and, and streets and, and have too many cars on the streets. There are lots of solutions you can come up with as far as um, parking permits and other things to make sure that um, our neighborhoods are not overburdened with parking as we um, come up with ways to build affordable housing in other parts of the city. Okay, for this next question, um, we'll go back to two minutes and we'll start this time with David. Uh, your current economic conditions risk a wave of foreclosures in sales of naturally affordable rental properties. What strategies should the city pursue to ensure these do not lead to a wave of displacement as that ha what that's happened in the last recession? Well, let me just start by saying that this really isn't a new challenge. I mean, this, the, the um, problem with affordability of housing in San Jose is not something that's happening because of current economic conditions or because of the pandemic. It was true long before the pandemic. We weren't doing enough in San Jose to provide affordable housing for our essential workers and for our residents even before. And clearly the problem has been exacerbated this year. Um, but you know, it used to be we were concerned about whether our essential workers, our police officers and teachers can afford to live here. Now even small business owners, service providers and other people are leaving our city because they can't afford to stay. Um, we're seeing it locally um, with people fleeing our schools, people moving away because they don't think there's a place here for them anymore. With the ability to work remotely, uh, people are moving out because of the affordability problems. So it's more crucial than ever that we address our need for affordable housing in the city. We need to do that, not just by relying on building market rate housing. Um, we need to make sure that as we build out our, um, our housing stock in the city, that we're enforcing our inclusionary housing policies across the city, making sure that in North San Jose, where we're supposed to be building 20% affordable housing inclusionary in our projects, that we're doing that. Um, that we're not letting developers off the hook, that we're building uh, enough affordable housing along with market rate housing. Um, that's better for the community. It will also prevent people from having to commute from far away. So it'll be better for traffic, better for our environment, better for everyone. We want people to be able to live here in our community, people who work here to have a vibrant community for everybody. There is a lot of untapped potential in North San Jose for development and we need a true vision for building in North San Jose. In addition, there are things the city should be doing in the short term to protect renters, and we're doing things by using our COVID relief funds 
um, to provide rental protection, to help protect landlords, to working with the state and, and federal grants to help um, with mortgage protection and renter protection. So there are obviously there's things we should do in the short term, but we should also be remembering that this is a long-term housing problem that we need to address in San Jose. Mm -hmm. Councilman Diaz? Could you, I, I lost a thread. It was about anti-displacement or? Um, I, I'll repeat the question. Current economic conditions risk a wave of foreclosures and sales of natural affordable rental properties. What strategies should the city pursue to ensure these do not lead to a wave of displacement as happened in the last recession? So COVID happened unexpectedly, but even before that, San Jose was doubling down on affordable housing. Um, I think just this last week, uh, you know, the city used state money for, uh, I think, what, $14.5 million from, from uh, governor's office or from the state down to San Jose uh, to purchase uh, some, some already existing affordable units to continue to using uh, those uh, as affordable housing uh, until I believe uh, 2075 or, or something to that effect. Uh, we were making it easier to build uh, granny flats, uh, ADUs in, in people's backyards. In fact, if you come to, to, well, you can't come to City Hall right now, it's closed, but if, but if you would come in on a Tuesday, uh, we have ADU Tuesdays and within an hour, uh, you can get yourself set up for an ADU in your backyard. Um, if you pick a, one of two uh, pre-approved uh, designs approved by the city, if you want to do your own, then that'll take longer. But, and we also have grants, a limited number of money for folks. Uh, to, if you rent that uh, unit to folks uh, below market rate, uh, you will uh, get uh, the benefit of, of some grant money to help build that in your backyard. Uh, we've dedicated 45% uh, of our affordable housing uh, dollars uh, to focus on helping uh, the extremely low income population. Uh, so these are things that, that, uh, we've been working towards uh, even before COVID. And I, I would say that you know we we've doubled down and we keep on pushing uh, and we stay the course. Uh, I, I don't know that there is perhaps well there is certainly more urgency now uh, to to the moment and to the need. Uh, but I don't know that we need to uh, steer from what we were doing because I think we were headed down a pretty uh, good course in, in making a dent uh, on this very important issue. Okay, now we're going to go to some rapid fire questions. So for these questions, you can either answer yes or no, or you can give a brief 30 second answer. Um, and so for all these questions, we'll just start with, uh, you know, Councilman Diep followed by David Kahn. Do you support Prop 15, aka schools and communities first? No, it's uh, the this, this split role and, and I, I'm uh, gonna stay the course. I think that uh, it's, it's gonna help or hurt small businesses. Well, um, as somebody who's been on a school board for a long time and, see, and, and remembers, knows that, you know, before Prop 13, California schools were the envy of the nation. I know that we need funding to make sure that we have um, enough resources in our schools. We need nurses and counselors and librarians. We're the worst in the nation in all of those areas. Um, and so we need to adequately fund our schools in order to support the business needs of our community. And, and so I'm supporting Prop 15. Do you support Measure G in San Jose, which consolidates three different charter amendments into one, including expanding the authority review of the independent, independent police auditor, expanding the planning commission from seven to 11 members, and extending redistricting deadlines as needed? Uh, yes, I, I voted to put it on the ballot. Yes, I support those measures, or that Measure G, those, those changes. Do you support Measure H in San Jose, which will increase the card room tax that will fund general city services, including homelessness? I do. Yes, I do. What is your position on Prop 16, which repeals the state's anti-affirmative action ban, Prop 209? Uh, the council unanimously voted uh, in support of that. Yes, I support it. And I wanna also point out that it's not just about public education, but also about government contracting and making sure that um, we are able to um, make sure that government contracts are and, and people hired into government jobs reflect the community that they serve. Uh, Councilman Diep, just to reiterate, you do support this, correct? Yes, I, I voted on, on council. We, we okay. unanimously did, yes. Just wanted to make that clear. Um, what is your position on Prop 21, which grants local jurisdictions greater flexibility to expand rent control ordinances? to expand rent control ordinances. I, I'm on the record as being against uh, rent control. I, I think it's imprecise. Um, it uh, hides important market signals and it's not means tested. I would much rather prefer uh, 
affordable uh, income restricted affordable housing where we know we're helping the people who most need it. Um, I, I often say that uh, you know rent control is like uh, if you need to fit into a dress, you can do the hard work of of dieting and exercising, or you can put on a corset. And uh, in the long term, the corset's not helpful or not healthy. And I, I, I think rent control is the equivalent of that. Well, it's interesting as we talk about worrying about displacement that we wouldn't at least believe that some form of rent control will be important at a time like this. Um, having said that, I, would, I do support Prop 21. You know, Prop 21 doesn't change rent control locally, but it does give local government the ability to at least have a conversation about what kind of rent control we would like to have here. And I think local control is always better. And so I support Prop 21 giving us the ability to have those conversations here in the city. Do you support Measure RR to fund Caltrain operations? I do. We, we definitely need uh, improvements along public transit. Yes, it's really important that we do that. Transportation is our largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. Research shows that expanding capacity for vehicles increases driving miles. Do you support redirecting fund funding from highway and expressway expansion to fund transit services? Uh, Depends on what we're talking about specifically. I'm, I'm comfortable with the, with the notion, but it really matters to me what we're cutting and, and what we're funding. I believe that, uh, that funding from those measures was intended to be uh, an, an all-inclusive measure that includes roads and transit. And so I do believe that transit should be um, part of that funding picture. And so if, that's, if, if, that, if redirection is what that takes, then yes, I believe that we should be funding transit from, from that measure. Okay, that was the last of the rapid fire questions. So for this next question, you get one minute each and we'll start with David this time. When transit vehicles get stuck in traffic, service is slower, less reliable, and more expensive to pr provide. Transit priority treatments have been shown to improve transit times for buses that often get trapped behind cars in traffic jams. Do you support transit signal priority and do you support dedicated bus lanes? Yes, I think there's a lot we can do with new technology and, and with transit uh, priority. Um, one of our problems with, with public transit in our county is the um, poor connectivity between systems and the inability for people to time and better predict when they're going to get from place to place. Um, the problem when people are, are, for example, transferring from light rail to bus, bus to, and bus to bus line, um, is if they're not going to get where they, from one place to another at the right time and they have to stand and wait, um, they're less likely to use that system. And so we need to make sure that buses run on time, that transit runs on time. Um, and if anything we can do to speed up that process by providing signal priority, I think is important for those systems to work better. Um, and there's a lot more we can do with new technology, even for timing of light signals at, at crucial intersections, even for our ve regular vehicular traffic. And there's part, places in District 4 where we have that problem, and I think we can use more modern technology to uh, improve our traffic flow conditions overall. Yeah, so I, I, I would agree with that. I, I know that uh, I've seen it work in other places. I've seen it work in Seattle. I've seen it work in other cities. Uh, I think there are hurdles um, that are unique to San Jose, uh, but it is certainly worth exploring. Um, I, I would support it. Okay, for this next question, uh, you each get two minutes and we'll start with Councilman Diet. As of August 31st, 2020, there were a total of 17,349 COVID-19 cases and a total of 244 COVID-19 related deaths in Santa Clara County. The data clearly indicates Black and Latinx residents are disproportionately affected. In your opinion, what is the role of the city in addressing the public health consequences of the pandemic, and how do you respond to the racial inequities in public health for Black and Latinx communities? So I, I wish that uh, the city had more of a role. Uh, and when I say role, I don't just mean uh, a moral obligation, I, I mean uh, a a seat at the table in terms of government. Uh, we as a city, our charter is about uh, parks and roads and, and public safety. Uh, we don't deal with the health issues. And, and so we, like everybody else, we being the city council, uh, you know, kind of wait and hear what Dr. Cody, what the folks at the county uh, decide. And, and we are impacted by that as well. Um, and additionally, we're not funded to do these sort of things. But to the question about the racial inequities, um, they're certainly there and we have to recognize it. And as policymakers, uh, we have to use the tools 
that are within our ability. Uh, again, those tools being the, the in the charter, the roads, the libraries, the parks, uh, and and build a, a community that uh, d that addresses that the best we can. Um, I think that there. In addition to whatever uh, health discrepancies that existed before that made uh, Latinx and uh, African American uh, community more susceptible to COVID, uh, I think part of that is also the, the stress of, of living in America, the stress of uh, living uh, in uh, in a, a, such a unaffordable place such as the Silicon Valley, and and those day to day stresses wear on you. Um, and it's not just you know physiological for whatever reason, but I think the way they're treated, the way uh, the, the the indignities that they suffer every day. Uh, add up and and wear you down and and quite literally uh, they kill you. David, oh, you know I believe that there's a lot the city can do to address the racial inequities that lead to different health outcomes in different parts of the city. Um, you know, I, there this pandemic has certainly exposed clear differences in how people in different zip codes are affected by COVID. Um, as a school board member, I saw these disparities firsthand. Um, we provide, for example, critical access to students and meals and technology. And when the schools closed, there was a lot of anxiety added to certain families in certain parts of the city who rely on these on schools for a safety net. And I was, you know, distributing meals and computers to students in the spring and saw the different, you know, needs in different parts of the community. Um, and so there's, a, you know, the city, um, you know, I, I joined a racial equity task uh, task force in the summer to try to um, a digital equity task force to make to ask the city to invest in, in building out digital infrastructure in parts of the city that needed it. And, and the city did uh, join that effort and, and we are uh, beginning to invest in, in making sure that certain parts of the city are getting access that they didn't have before. The city uh, did this year um, create a an office of racial equity to begin to study what we can do as we use our budget to, um, to make sure that parts of the city that have been underinvested in are getting the right kind of investments in the future. Uh, the council member voted against that office in 2019 and was was opposed to it, wrote an op-ed against it um, when that came to a vote. But, you know, obviously this year with all of the attention on racial equity, the council, the majority of the council changed their tune and voted for that office. There's a lot we can do as we begin to invest in cleaning up our air, making sure that as we electrify our infrastructure that we're doing it first in the parts of the city that have poor health care, poor air quality because they have more transportation, uh, dirty transportation around them. It's the same areas that have dirty air quality, that have um, poor infrastructure. Those are the same areas, the same zip codes that had poor COVID outcomes. The city can invest in improving those parts of the community so that the next time these kinds of things hit, the outcomes won't be as bad as poor. So there are things that the, that the city can do as we improve our infrastructure to make sure that, that these communities have a better health care outcome in the future. Uh, Councilman, do you, would you like to respond to David's comment um, about your vote that you took last year um, against the Office of Racial Equity? Sure, please. Uh, so David mentions the op-ed I wrote in the Mercury News, and I stand by that. You guys can Google it, and, and it's still up there. Um, and the issue about, you know, don't politicize the budget. The budget is generally something that historically we vote uh, unanimously on, uh, and, and there was a risk that time, and actually it was not supported unanimously uh, during that time. About five days or so before we heard the budget, uh, we vote on the budget, uh, some of my colleagues held a press conference and uh, really pushed for a half a million dollars to uh, fund uh, equity. And at that time, just like now, we were uh, under-resourced, um, understaffed, and we had a lot of uh, needs to put money towards. And I did not think that using money to study what to do was as important as doing it. And it's true that it was politicized because what happened was uh, we offered $200,000 instead of the 500, one-time dollars. And Councilman Perales uh, said, no, I don't want that. Please change the motion so I'm not on the record of rejecting $200,000 toward equity. If it was really about equity, they would have taken the money and they would have made some progress for equity. David, would you like to rebuttal at all? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I think the bottom line is that the city could could have made some progress on some of these issues um, sooner by having an office responsible for looking into how we can invest our budget um, in a way that that improves equity outcomes. And you you know you, you know you can frame it any way you want. There's always a tight budget in the city, and you know things get better, things get worse. Um, we always have a limited budget, but it's never going to be the ideal time to invest in improving parts of the city that have had underinvestment. Um, the the question is, um, what is the right thing to do for residents who have historically not gotten the pro the right amount of 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 help from the city? 
Um, and there are many things that we can do uh, um, without necessarily, that don't necessarily cost us money, but the city does need to put some, some time and thought into how to invest. Now we've created that office and I'm glad we've done that, um, but we could have been ahead of the game and it would have been nice to have done that before the pandemic hit. Now for our, um, our viewers on Zoom, you can go ahead and start putting uh, your questions in the Q&A box if you have a question for either of our candidates. Um, and we'll move on to the next question, which you will also get uh, two minutes to respond to. And we will start with, I think we left off on Councilman Diep, I believe. Um, the tragic death of George Floyd, Ahmed Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, among others, sparked a national outcry over the treatment of Black Americans by police officers. Local San Jose residents and activists mobilized and took to the streets in solidarity with other marchers and rallies across the country, decrying excessive and sometimes deadly use of force by police officers. Often lost in this conversation is policing of homelessness and how it has been racialized. As a council member, how will you resolve increased tensions and distrust among black and brown communities toward the San Jose Police Department? In your opinion, what will it take to restore that trust and also ensure that black and brown unsheltered residents are afforded the same civil rights as everyone else? I think that we need to put more of an emphasis on uh, community policing. We do some of that, but still San Jose doesn't have enough police officers. I, I know that there is this call for defunding the police. Uh, I'm, I've you know, come out on and reforming and, and reimagining uh, because San Jose still lacks the, the public safety uh, that we need when somebody is burglarized or, or there's some issue, sometimes officers don't even respond. Uh, and we also need more of them so that they can have more people covering and engaging with the community. And so young kids look up at police officers and they see them as protectors, uh, not somebody who comes in and, uh, you know, arrests an adult figure in the household, uh, or not only just that. Uh, the question is to homeless uh, enge engagement with, with SJPD. And part of, you know, reimagining police is better training and, and you know, uh, bias, anti-bias training, uh, and trying to alleviate just society-wide, not just between police and homeless people, but I think through everybody, uh, this stigma uh, of, 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 of race. And, you know, I, I was reading um, that, that cast recently, and, and I think that book by uh, Mrs. Wilkerson, uh, Isabel Wilkerson, really puts a lot of things into context for me, uh, talking about race, but not so much about the race in terms of racism and overt malice towards skin color and uh, a, a, a malicious hate towards people, but this idea that just in a very human way, we all like to feel that we're better off than somebody, that we're not at the bottom of the totem pole. And, uh, and so while we as Americans don't formally adopt the caste system like, like we, some other uh, cultures do, uh, inadvertently we do. And at the very bottom of that rung are, are the African -American, is the African American community. Uh, so how do we have conversations and engagements to lift people up and, and help everyone understand that we're all just humans and, and uh, we may come from different places, but we all have the same needs and uh, overcome uh, our own problems. And once we have that empathy and that uh, connection, I think society will be in a better place. David? Um, well, the reality is that many people feel they're not being heard and not being served. So we should certainly be willing to take a look at what's happening and, and um, evaluate what changes might need to be made. And, I will say, you know, I am a parent and a homeowner, and it is important that we have a safe community. And so I certainly um, want to make sure it's clear. I, I don't believe that defunding the police is, is the right path forward. But I do think that we have to be open to potentially reforming the way we fund public safety services. Um, so I, I think it's time to take a look at, you know, a, a review of all the different kinds of calls that San Jose police make and what kinds of how they respond to those calls and find out whether the response by police is always the best course of action. Homelessness is one of those cases where it may be that in many cases, police being the first people on the scene is not the correct thing. And that's one of the reasons for distrust that we have from, from homeless people and from uh, especially a, a black and brown homeless people. If the police are always the first people to show up. It's showing a, a certain level of um, distrust in that community. If we have different kinds of responses that may be more productive. Um, we should, what we learned from the study might tell us that there's other kinds of services that we could be funding with some of our, our resources that we have in the city. We could be investing in social workers or community service officers. 
we could be providing job training programs or counseling services that actually help people get back on their feet or direct them into the services that they need that might help them um, become housed or, or get the services that will get them back on their feet. Um, once we learn about that, we can invest more heavily in the areas of policing that are very effective. Those are, there are clearly areas of the police department that are underfunded and our communities will be grateful if we, if we invest more heavily in those areas, but we can reinvest in other types of services, the areas that would be more appropriate. Um, and that will, I think, um, build a better level of trust with some other parts of the community that where, where um, police response hasn't always been productive. So for these next couple of questions, which will be uh, two minutes each, I want to introduce Celine Chandler. She is on Destination Homes Lived Experience Advisory Board, um, which is composed of uh, former and current unhoused individuals. So um, why don't you go ahead and take it away, Celine? Can you give us one second to get her on screen? Hello, everyone. Hello, Celine. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, hi, Celine. Yeah. Hello. So my question is, um, currently more than 133,000 county residents filed for unemployment since the start of shelter in place. Advocates now estimate more than 44,000 residents are at a high risk of being evicted. What should the city be doing to prevent thousands of San Jose residents from falling into homelessness or being priced out of the city? I guess it's my turn to answer first. Okay. <laughs> um, well, again, this is a problem that predated the pandemic. Obviously, again, it's been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, but but I, I will repeat, uh, the city hasn't done enough to build affordable housing, which has you know, made our, us very susceptible. I, and of course, I'll point out it's not just San Jose, but you know, a national problem um, where affordable housing just hasn't been built. But San Jose had an opportunity to get more affordable housing built, and particularly in North San Jose. Um, so I believe, at, in addition to that, I believe that the city um, should now pursue opening some sanctioned encampments, which will provide safe places for our unhoused community to live um, while they're on the street. Um, it will provide monitor facilities, um, prov provide safe places for people to live and facilities for people to use, keep our communities safer and cleaner. Um, it will also prevent encampments from growing around our neighborhoods, which is something that's really um, affecting our, our community right now. Um, I'm disappointed that our council hasn't been able to follow through on the plan to build temporary housing villages, which was the goal of the council. Um, you know, they were supposed to build uh, the plan was to build at least 10 of these villages around the city and as of now only a couple have opened in the last few years. We need to really push to get more locations that will help people transition. Um, in addition, we should be investing uh, more heavily in nonprofits um, and organizations like Destination Home who work um, to prevent people from becoming homeless and losing their homes. By providing some extra resources, you know, we, we know from studies that it's cheaper to invest some of these resources up front than it is to deal with the costs of um, homelessness and what, what those costs bring to the city to, to clean up after. So we should be providing additional um, resources to, to organizations like that that prevent people and provide financial help for people, um, prevent them from becoming homeless in the first place, providing rent assistance and other financial help that, for people who are living paycheck to paycheck. So, so the, uh, the, the problem identified uh, is, is a very real one. And at the city, uh, we've tried within our ability uh, to impose an eviction moratorium. Um, and not only that, anticipating that whenever the moratorium lifts, when, uh, whenever we return to quote unquote normal times, uh, renters in, in San Jose uh, aren't immediately pushed off a cliff into eviction, uh, but they have a one year to pay their back rent, uh, at so long as by six months they've paid down at least half of that debt. I, know, I understand that still, uh, that's very, uh, that's a high threshold even still. Uh, yet the, 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 the push to say, let's erase rent 
um, I don't think is, is workable or feasible either. I, I feel that this is something that is beyond the scope of San Jose or any city, any local jurisdiction. And it really demands the involvement of not just the state government, uh, but the federal government. Uh, we at the city uh, get limited dollars. Uh, we spend them on services. We're not spending enough on the things that we're responsible for. Uh, what needs to be uh, passed is some sort of relief package. And whether it's state money or federal fund uh, money, I understand that it's only Congress or the federal government that can uh, print money, that can uh, run a deficit on the budget. States and cities can't. Uh, and so the ask to uh, you know, pay off the landlords uh, so they can pay the banks or to you know, pay the tenants so that they can pay their rent, uh, that is a great idea, except that it is not feasible uh, in, 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 uh, in practice. And you can pass the laws and you can try to do it, but, but in reality, uh, you're, you're going to be sending the wrong signals uh, and the, the housing providers, the folks that, that build the housing, or if they know that this is going to happen in San Jose, then they're not, they're not going to be likely to build affordable or market rent uh, housing in San Jose. Thank you. So my second question is, on any given night, there are up to 6,172 residents living in our streets, creeks, and parks. What more should the city be doing to address their needs and help them into permanent housing? Me first, then I guess. Uh, so, so I, again, uh, reflecting back on what the city can do uh, in terms of what our mandates are, and and I think for for me, uh, the city's uh, contribution to this, in addition to the dollars and the HUD dollars that that we get and we put towards this, uh, is really around land use. Um, David alluded earlier to his disappointment that we weren't building enough. Uh, I think it was he said temporary shelters, but I think he was talking about tiny home villages um, where we're supposed to have one in every council district. And, and we did a full on review of parcels of land in San Jose owned by the city. And it's not just again pointing at a parcel, but there are uh, neighborhood concerns. You can't, uh, they don't want a homeless uh, encampment uh, or a tiny home village uh, too close to a school. Uh, because of environmental regulations, you can't have it too close to a creek. Uh, and when you put all those ifs and buts and setbacks uh, into the algorithm, quote unquote algorithm, uh, what you end up with in a city as large as San Jose, 10th largest in America, in every council district, there was one, maybe two parcels of land that was uh, okay to build a tiny home. And so it ended up being that we were able to build two right now, one right in, uh, next to the Barris of Bart Station, and then there's another one coming online uh, right at the 101 280 interchange. But neither of those parcels are owned by the city. We had to go and say, hey, uh, Santa Clara County, hey, VTA, hey, Caltrans, uh, can you bail us out? Can you help us out here? Because the city of San Jose owns a big fat goose egg of usable land uh, for these, these uh, homeless villagers. And that's the real problem. Where do we find the land? Uh, you have to purchase it somehow, but you're competing at market value. There is, of course, uh, eminent domain, uh, but that's something to be used sparingly uh, and, and not just willy-nilly. So it's, it is a puzzle. And really, to move forward in it, you have to understand, at least identify this as a problem, uh, and have some sort of uh, understanding and, and, I dare say, uh, uh, expertise uh, in, in land use to find identify ways to do it because there are laws upon laws in California uh, and you have to navigate them. Um, yeah, th these things are difficult and I, I will um, just say that we have to, you, you'll notice that many of the times we, when we have these debates that uh, the council member will often say, well, these things are limited by, by you know, land use and other policies, but I'll, I'll just say that, you know, what I've learned in my many years of public service is that, you, you, you know, the best thing, the most important thing you have to do is to, is to set a goal and, and push to actually achieve that goal. And many times the, the hurdles are pretty significant, but if you set your mind to it, you can find ways to get it done. And I think the city can find ways to get some of these things done. Um, in addition to, to some of the things I talked about before, um, I've long been a proponent of um, access to mental health services. Um, as a school board member, um, we brought many uh, mental health services in for our students and I've seen how providing social workers and counselors has improved behavioral and academic outcomes. And so I believe the city and county um, need to invest more heavily in on the ground mental health services for, her, for our unhoused residents. Um, and so you know, we talked before about uh, trust with, of homeless residents in the police. The first people into, into encampments shouldn't necessarily be 
police officers, but we should be sending mental health professionals in to talk with and meet um, homeless people, uh, get to know what their specific needs are, tailor specific responses, help guide them to the services that they need. I think that we can get a lot um, uh, of, of improvements in results by doing that, finding out how we can help individual uh, individuals and provide them with the care that they need and maybe help them uh, get to the places that will, will get them resources so that they can um, begin to get back into places, into, you know, into society and, and, and back, get back into, um, on their feet and be able to afford, you know, find jobs and get in, and afford uh, housing again. Um, we, and to do this, we'll need to work with you know, our county, our neighboring cities, you know, pool resources to be able to afford um, to support nonprofits who provide these kinds of services. Okay, well, thank you so much, Celine, um, for asking those few questions. Now we're gonna uh, go on to audience member questions. Um, so this first one, uh, we'll have two minutes and we'll start with David. The city adopted a North San Jose plan that had a goal of 20% affordability. So far, only 4% of the housing in North San Jose is affordable. What would you do to ensure that future housing in North San Jose is affordable so it is not an area of haves and have-nots? Yeah, this is, a, this is a really important question. I believe that in order for North San Jose to be a vibrant community, and I think it can be a vibrant community, that we have to make sure that the projects that are built there have a good mix of affordable housing and different levels of affordable housing. Um, we want the communities that are built there to have um, you know, people who work in various kinds of jobs to be able to live together. We know that a, good, a, 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 a really strong San Jose will be one where people of all income levels can live together, teachers, firefighters, um, retail workers, and also the high tech workforce that's living in North San Jose all need to live together. Um, so I think that we can we can get it done by holding um, to our commitment and making sure that developers uh, find creative ways to make those projects happen. And for example, by making sure that we're using the commercial linkage fee and, and some of our other um, money that we now have in San Jose to help subsidize some of the, the housing that's the affordable housing elements of the projects in North San Jose so that the projects that are being built include 20% affordable housing. And I think it can be done. There's a lot more that needs to be done in North San Jose in addition to just making sure we have affordable housing. We need to have a vision for a livable, walkable community that is more than just uh, you know, individual projects. I think we need to think about how do we have an entertainment center there? How do we have shopping there? How do we have a real vibrant community? Um, you know, we talk about urban villages in North San Jose, but putting a building with a Starbucks next to light rail is not an urban village. That's a place where people can get on the light rail now to now go to BART and go to work, but when they come home, they still need to get in their car to go shopping. We really need to, if I think if we do it right, we can get a community that has a walkable, livable, um, city-like environment that can be beneficial to everybody with a library, a community center, and parks, and all the resources that a, that a good community needs. Councilman Diep. Sure, I, I'll take criticism from what the city's doing, uh, but I, I just want to quickly point out that uh, the, the urban village that we have in, in our district four is, is at the Berryessa Community Center, and, and there are no plans uh, on the books, at least, for an urban village uh, in North San Jose. So, so the comment about you know a Starbucks next to a light rail being an urban village is, is taken uh, because we do need a lot, whole lot more up there. Uh, but nothing anyone sees up there right now is is the San Jose's vision of an urban village uh, in action. In action, uh, the the issue of 20% uh, affordable housing being the goal in North San Jose and us only having 4% is a real Real tragedy of, of, of history, uh, of circumstance. We, not we, before my time, uh, but the city council enacted an affordable impact fee, affordable housing impact fee, um, or sorry, we had inclusionary housing requiring that developers build 20% affordable housing in North San Jose. Uh, we were sued and that case went to the Supreme Court. Uh, in the interim, uh, we, again before my time, passed an affordable housing impact fee, uh, but there was also development uh, looking to go into North San Jose. And the council at that time uh, had a decision. Do we hold the line and say nothing gets built in North San Jose until we work all this uh, legal uh, uncertainty out? Or do we let housing be built because we need housing of all sorts? And the council at that time said, let's let housing be built. And because uh, the 
the, the inclusionary housing rule was legally challenged. Uh, it took some years uh, and we did not immediately have an affordable housing impact fee to fall back on. Uh, in, a, in a short period of many months, few years, uh, all the housing came up in North San Jose uh, with barely any of it being affordable. And uh, that poses a problem to this day. It is a uh, hard nut to crack uh, because uh, whoever wants to help us out of it needs to be flexible, it needs to be realistic, it needs to understand the history and also the terrain of, of North San Jose. And of course, uh, the zoning, which is something that I think I pride myself on, uh, on the city council, more so than other council members. I think second probably only to Mayor Licardo. Um, I'm, I'm the land use guy. Okay, our next question, um, we will start with Councilman Diep and it will be uh, one minute each. Uh, the council just approved a commercial linkage fee ordinance with fees far lower than other surrounding jurisdictions. As a council member, will you support increasing this fund when it is brought back for consideration? Uh, I will, we, we voted to look to study it. So I wanna see the study. I wanna see uh, what the feasibility is. Um, we had a study that was conducted prior to COVID uh, and it, uh, and then a feasibility study that suggested uh, upwards of, I think 35,000, sorry, $35 per square foot, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in the downtown core. Uh, what we ended up passing was a $15 square foot, uh, $12 if you pay up front. Uh, and that was because even in the study, uh, we, uh, they, the, the people who conducted the study said that, you know, this is outdated data. It's, it, it doesn't, it kind of guesses about COVID, but it's, it's not realistic. Uh, it's not accurate. And leading up to those, uh, that vote, just a day or two before, we had, um, I forget, I think it was Pinterest uh, in San Francisco willing to pay $96 million, I believe, to break a lease because they didn't want to have a fiscal office uh, space in San Francisco anymore. Uh, and given that reality, uh, I I think we moved the ball on affordable housing. We're going to get dollars for it. Um, is it as much as advocates want? No, but it is a step forward for affordable housing and it is a win. David? Uh, yeah, I, yes, I, I support a higher um, commercial linkage fee. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm appreciative that the council came around. I, I think a year earlier, the council wouldn't have supported any commercial linkage fee, which is kind of interesting. You know, I hear the council members and I, I'm not necessarily singling out any individual council member, but the council members who were against a higher impact fee a year earlier were saying that they didn't want any impact fee and now they're blaming COVID for the low number that they picked this year. I think that they, um, the opposite was happening. There was so much pressure now to have an, a linkage fee that they agreed to have one even though it was somewhat low and then they blamed COVID for the fact that it was low. Um, I think we can afford that we can in our city have an impact, a, a commercial linkage fee that's comparable to the cities around us. Um, my belief is that developers will build in the city based on demand and that the commercial linkage fee um, will, should be comparable and we should be able to get um, money that pays for the impacts and will help us meet the biggest challenge that our city has, which is building affordable housing. Okay, so our um, next question from our, an audience member um, will also be one minute each and we'll start again with David. Um, this person says, a number of audience members asked a question that touched upon a vision for North San Jose. We asked about affordable housing in that er area, but what is your vision for Alviso? Um, so, so Alviso is, a, you know, a, a great historic community. And I think, you know, whatever, whatever we do at Alviso has to take into account preserving the history of the community and the character of the community. Um, it also has to take into account the, the really important ecological um, needs of, of being the only bayfront in San Jose. Um, we, we have the concerns of, of rising sea level and climate change. We have the concerns of the marshland and, and bird habitats there. And so what we do there depends a lot on, on the, um, the ecological impacts, on preserving the history. Um, and so I, I'm a little bit cautious about um, large scale development in Alviso. I think that, you, you know, uh, a tasteful housing developments there can be, can be useful. But I also think that we need to um, make sure that we have uh, modernized road infrastructures there. We, the area has been neglected in some parts of the, of some parts of Alviso and we need to make sure that the residents who are there are taken care of. Councilman Diep. Yeah, so if we're just asking about my my personal vision. I'm not any plans. Uh, I I would love to see uh, like a harbor type area, a waterfront 
um, a paseo, uh, whatever you want to call it. You can walk out there, enjoy the water, have some lunch, uh, you know, get ice cream, take some photos, uh, be out there with your kids, family, uh, be a real tourist attraction. And if possible, get ferry service out of Alviso like we used to have uh, back historically before the trains came. Uh, so you can go to uh, San Francisco or, or Oakland or, or Richmond or wherever. Um, I mean, that's, that's the vision. Uh, I don't know that that's feasible because uh, we haven't had the ferry service for so long and, and it would cost uh, an exorbitant amount of money to dredge uh, the, the bay right now to, to make that happen. Uh, but on the larger point, I think Alviso is historic. I think it is special in that it's not cookie cutter. Uh, it's the only place in San Jose that I know where you can see um, a, a mini mart next to somebody's house. Uh, I really like that vibe and, and I would do my best to preserve it as is without too much interference uh, from modernity. Okay, our next question will also be at one minute and we will start again with Councilman Diep. Uh, tiny home villages have been a controversial topic in District 4. All council members have agreed to consider them in their district, but so far all have been located in District 3. What would you do to push for a tiny home village in District 4? I don't know that it's that's necessarily true. The, the, the one that we do have by the BART station is technically in District 3. We have a second one coming up, and I believe that's in District 7. Um, I, so, so, but to the point, I won't. Um, I do agree that we need one in, in every district. And we looked at a land inventory already and, and we attempted to do it. Each district had one, maybe two parcels uh, of available land. And when we talked to the community about it, um, I was, uh, at least in District 4, residents were unhappy with it. The parcel we identified was by the Barrier Library. Library. Uh, I believe it's along Noble Road. There's a field there. And uh, I was, uh, I held a, a community meeting with the supervisor, Dave Cortezzi, about homelessness. And the people who showed up didn't want to talk about homelessness. They want to talk about the tiny homes. Uh, and they shouted down the supervisor. He left early. He left me hanging uh, to take that, that meeting by myself. And when I left, I was, uh, I had a human tunnel just uh, shouting, shouting against me. And I stayed to the very end talking to every individual uh, until they left uh, because I wouldn't run away. And that is kind of the, the attitude I will take to it. I'll talk to everybody who wants to discuss it uh, to explain everything that, that they need to hear. David? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a tough one. I, I was a parent at the school where the property was near. I mean, so I understand that, you know, people get very anxious with location. But I mean, I think the solution first of all we need to be very firm and say look this is a community problem and homeless people are living right next to the school and right under the creek and right next to your uh, right next to here right now anyway and people don't understand that you there that that w what we're talking about is making your community safer and i think we need to be very firm about um helping people understand that and actually what we've what we've seen in the last um few months as more homeless encampments have grown right around neighborhoods is a, is a willingness for people to, to believe that if you actually had a safe place, even if it were close by, it would be better than the current setup where, where um, people are, are making themselves at home in places that are less safe. Um, having said that, I think that introducing people in their community to actual residents who, are, who need places to live and, and getting people to know uh, people who live on the streets actually uh, makes people feel a, a, a connection and and under, and gets to know people as real people and helps them uh, feel a little bit more empathy and um, less fear about having a, a community near their home and near their uh, community. Okay, our next question is also a minute and we'll start with you, David. Um, how will you ensure students at Orchard School are safe now that Charcot Avenue is being expanded? Yeah, you know, this is one of those um, issues that I that uh, you know I, I'm I, I don't know that the project is is necessarily finalized. I mean, we have there's still a lot of things that have to happen before the project is done. Um, I think that over time we need to adjust um, our thoughts about where roads get put. Unfortunately, the general plan was written 25 years ago before there was a school there, and it would have been better to have reconsidered that road project once the school and neighborhood were put in place without enough space for the road. Um, we needed, if, if in fact the road was going to be built in that location, we needed an overcrossing or, an un, or a bridge under for students to make sure that there was a place for people to walk safely. We don't have that. Um, we also have the concern about large amounts of traffic and noise and, and, and exhaust right near the school. Um, so I will continue to advocate against having that road there. And I think that it's 
um, still, you know, not completely done deal. Um, but, you know, I, I will add, make sure that we have safety um, in place to, uh, you know, crossing guards and other things in place for the students if that project is built. Council Mindia? Yeah, so um, we, we have taken into consideration the uh, safety of school children crossing. Uh, the, the, over, uh, the Charcot overpass does uh, uh, divide the school and, and the residential area. Um, we're putting in a, a hawk signal, uh, which is not just a red light or a simple thing, but it, it kind of is in your face and uh, it is uh, more jarring than a, a normal stoplight. And, uh, you know, there, there have been accusations or, or characterizations of, of us putting a, a highway into a residential neighborhood, but really this is uh, a single lane in each direction um, overcrossing and it, it opens up to accept a, a left turn uh, on one end. And so it opens up uh, to, to three lanes that students will be crossing. Um, and as we talk about urbanizing San Jose, we talk about densifying, uh, you think about uh, places where kids do actually cross city streets, New York City going to school, Chicago, uh, real urban environments, and they do it every day. And for any politician, any elected official, uh, public safety is first and foremost, and especially that of children. And so we will take every precaution necessary to preserve their, their health and safety. Okay, this is our final question, and it will also be a minute, and we'll start with Councilman Diep. Um, you know, the last few weeks, California has been hit by a raging wildfire. Um, you know, what is your plan to make sure this city is prepared for any disasters? What would you do to make sure that people are safe, safe and healthy? Uh, that's a pretty broad, um, safe and healthy. I, I think that we, we need to understand and recognize that this is probably the new normal, uh, whether it's, it's climate change, wildfires, uh, flooding, uh, super storms, or even uh, health pandemics. Uh, we need to factor this in uh, to whatever we're baking. And uh, that, that may mean um, making sure that higher, better standards, uh, fire safety standards for, for new buildings, uh, that they're fire resistant, uh, you know, allotting for uh, school class sizes and such that that aren't you know, overcrowded where it's 30 or more stu students to a teacher uh, to accommodate for the social distancing, the physical distancing, uh, but rethinking uh, how we've done things and then affecting it into policy. Um, the policy thinking is, is the fun part. It's the imagining uh, the better world. Uh, the, the harder part is finding dollars for it because the way that cities are funded, um, as uh, you know, one learns when you kind of dig into the weeds in the budget, it's, it's pretty upside down. Uh, and, and San Jose is not funded for what is expected of us and, and we need more business to, to help generate those dollars. David? Well, I would say we talked about some of these things tonight. It's addressing some of the issues of equity. It's making sure that we have uh, cooperation with our county and, and state to make sure that we have resources in place to be prepared. Um, we need to make sure that uh, we have the right, you know, staffing and coverage for our fire department so that we have the right response times to get across our city. Um, you know, I, I, um, I, I would say that this is an opportunity to mention probably the, one of the most important issues that we shouldn't lose sight of, which is climate change. I mean, we, we shouldn't rest on the fact that the city has been a decent leader in climate change because there's a lot more we can do. We need to, to really accelerate our electrification of our infrastructure, making sure that we electrify our buses, making sure that we um, retrofit buildings that aren't up to code. Uh, make sure that we put more solar into our into our buildings and rooftops. Make sure that we build everything up to modern green code, um, even better than than we've been talking about in the past. Uh, improve our transportation infrastructure in a way that's going to get us to carbon zero. So we should be a leader to, uh, nationally and a model for um, reducing to carbon zero. Okay, and we are going to go ahead and finish up with uh, one minute closing statements each. Um, we'll start with you, David. Okay. Um, well, I've called District 4 my home for over 22 years and raised my family here. Uh, during my 20 years serving the community on the school board and library commission, I've learned that what our community wants most is an engaged council member who has an open door and will be responsive and interactive with neighbors and reach, who reach out for help from the city. Um, the lack of that kind of responsiveness over the last four years is why community leaders across the district asked me to run. I didn't run for this seat when it was open five years ago because I was focused on my career in high tech and my family and on the work we do every day in the school board to strengthen our local public schools. Um, but I've watched many problems in our city get worse and the council grow more divided. And so I decided that our district needs and deserves a stronger advocate in city hall. Um, it is important to note that I'm not running for an open seat 
but I'm running against an incumbent. And that's because I feel that there are many ways that the district isn't being adequately served. And so, you know, I, it is important to make sure people understand that there are differences between us and um, that people should, should look and decide wh which um, style and what substance they prefer in their candidate. Thank you. Councilman Diet. Yeah, uh, so I appreciate the opportunity to dis discuss uh, housing and, and equity issues tonight at uh, this forum. I've been the council member for four years and it's been uh, a real honor, a real learning experience. It's changed me and uh, I, I really have felt that I've really dug into the nooks and crannies of it and trying to read as much as I can, learn as much as I can. Uh, and to build a better San Jose. And I think we're, we're on a, a good trajectory. I'd like to continue serving. Uh, I uh, have been responsive uh, over emails, over uh, in-person meetings. I've made myself available on social media, I think unlike any other council member uh, in the history of San Jose. Uh, and uh, I, I kind of reject the criticism that I, I don't listen. Uh, my opponent, um, you know, says that he's a leader who listens and I think of a tonight's discussion through the nuances between us uh, I think it's good that he would because uh, you know he does have a lot to learn still about city stuff uh, and I think with that experience in mind already uh, I am best positioned to continue uh, self helping San Jose uh, move forward towards a brighter future. Okay well I am we just like to thank our uh, forum sponsors tonight Silicon Valley at Homes Action Fund and California Yimby and the co-hosts Silicon Valley Community Foundation, the Tech Equity Collaborative, Abode Services, EAH Housing, First Community Housing, and Destination Home. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Len.